do is put some money in and create a prize so that people are motivated to uh, create autonomous um, defense systems capable of reasoning about flaws and formulating patches and deploying all this in real time. So what they decided to do is uh, have a challenge uh, called Capture the Flag. And the, the idea of this game is that you, you have teams of people that uh, part of them are defenders, part of them are attackers. And everybody's on, on a network, and so there's, there's files that represent the flags. And so what your job is is to hack into the other system and, and read the, the, the file or copy the file and then claim you know, that you got their flag. Meanwhile, the other part of the team is analyzing their system and securing it as fast as they can before people can get in. And so it's, it's both offense and defense, and it's a, it's a game that helps to sharpen uh, cybersecurity skills. So with the Cyber Grand Challenge, what they did is they created an OS that was a lot like Linux and put it on uh, QMU. Um, it was simplified uh, in terms of the, uh, the system calls because they didn't want people to get hung up on defending you know, 180 different uh, system calls, and, and I think with Linux it's more like 300, because um, that takes away from the goal you know, of, of um, being able to just create a cyber reasoning system. Uh, you know, where with Linux, you'd be, you'd be stuck uh, trying to figure out all the different flows and defending against all those. So what they have is, um, you know, the, the ability to write and, and read, uh, the ability to allocate memory, deallocate memory, uh, to wait for I.O. Uh, they also need uh, a random uh, number um, so they can do the fuzzing. And then there's, you know, the exit system call. So the, the job of the, of the Cyber Grand Challenge was, you know, to analyze the program find a vulnerability, patch it, and maintain the normal function of, of the program, and then take the exploits that you just discovered and attack the other systems with it. So this is you know, the typical uh, flow of, of how uh, these, things, these things work. Um, when, when the game started, you know, they started fuzzing. Uh, you know, they, have, they have like 20 different uh, binaries. And so they would start fuzzing the, the, um, the program, and um, when they, when they find the problem, uh, they would have a proposed exploit because the fuzzer would have you know, the, the input that caused the crash. And so then what they would do is feed that to something that would create a patch to defend against the, the attack. And so now they have a proposed exploit and they have a proposed patch, and then it would go through automatic testing. And if it worked, then you've got the exploit you know, to deploy against other people, and you've got a patch binary to defend against attacks in case the other teams find the same vulnerability that you have. But that's just a piece of it. You know, if you take a look, what I just described to you is just that, that part in the red box there. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff. I mean, you know, they were using uh, uh, American Fuzzy Lop as the, as the fuzzer. But they also have uh, something, um, you know, at least the, the Shellfish team has something called Network Dude. And what this did is it sniffed the network connection so that they could see what other teams were, were trying to deploy against them in case you know, they missed something in their fuzzing. So you know, they were definitely taking intelligence in uh, from, from other teams uh, as they attacked their system to see you know, here, here's the packets coming in. It resulted in a crash. You know, now we need to put that through the, uh, the thing I described in the last slide. Uh, the other pieces um, are, are not as, as interesting. So uh, the results were there was 82 bugs uh, planted into the contest. Uh, vulnerabilities were only found for 20 of them. Unintended vulnerabilities were found in at least five of the 20. And uh, the majority of the flaws were stack overflows. And there was only one uh, successful heap corruption. And I just wanted to also show you, you know, this is uh, you know, the, the competitors. And notice that it takes a whole rack of computers to do this. And so that kind of leads me to the conclusion is you really can't do this. You can't do it like this, you know, in a data center. That, you know, if, you're, if your object is to defend one system or, you know, defend a web server or something like that, you're going to have to come up with a different strategy. That This is all great, you know, as a, as a game, but there's 20 computers involved in doing all this to, to defend one, one system. OK, so let's take a look at what might be um, possible. You know, seeing, seeing the future, you know, what, what they have, 
and then taking a step back and saying, okay, so what do we have today, what we can do with it? So um, has, has anybody here heard of kill chains? This is not the kill chain. <laughs> uh, a while back, I think it was around 2012, uh, Lockheed Martin uh, came out with um, a paper that described a sequence that uh, an attacker goes through. Um, you know, the first step, you know, is reconnaissance. Uh, they, they do reconnaissance, weaponized delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and then actions on the objective. So you know, in this first phase, what they're doing is research on, on the, the target. You know, they're trying to get the, the identity of, of people and, and select, you know, which, which are the attack points. So then after they, they got the attack points, they know what they want to attack, and so they got to create an exploit uh, to take advantage of this. The next step is to get the weapon to the target. And that could be an email, you know, that could be a TCP packet, you know, aimed at a, a service. Okay, so then the next step is the weapons code gets triggered, which you know can be somebody clicking on an email, uh, and then it proceeds to uh, backdoor, uh, you know, on the install on the on the target, and uh, then you know you want to maintain persistence. So then the next thing is it calls home uh, to get further instructions about you know what what to do. And then once they've, they've got the instructions, you know, they can, they can move out against the objective. Now, I also wanted to give a sense of time on these things. Um, you know, reconnaissance can, can take hours, maybe days. Uh, weaponization varies because once you've identified your target, uh, it may take you days, weeks, months uh, to create the, the exploit for it. But here's uh, the, the point that, that you really should notice, though, is that the uh, the delivery, exploitation, and installation is, is over in seconds. And then once, once they've got past that phase and they've called home to get further instructions, they can stay hidden for months. You know, they can take actions towards the objective for months, you know, without, without you noticing. Okay, so um, who, who all here has heard of attack? Okay, so this is gonna be new for everybody. Oh, we didn't expect that, did we? <laughs> okay, so what attack is, is that this is uh, uh, a system uh, uh, created by MITRE. Uh, you may know of MITRE because they create the OVAL, uh, CVE, uh, XCCDF, uh, and some other security standards. This is uh, related to their, their work on uh, KPEC and CWE. But it's, uh, the, the acronym stands for Adversarial Tactics, Techniques, and Common Knowledge. And what this is, a, is, is it's a formal catalog of actions that the adversary can, can take after compromise. You know, so that's the, the whole thing is after compromise. So this can help determine you know, the coverage uh, you know, when you're uh, looking at your defenses. And it can uh, describe an intrusion chain um, based on the techniques from start to finish with a you know, common reference, meaning that there, you know, just like Oval has a common um, a labeling, uh, this creates a catalog of, of names that you can use to talk intelligently about uh, attacks. So this is how it relates uh, to the kill chain, is that um, the, there, there's two parts. You know, there's the, the pre-attack, which is something that they, they just created recently, and then there's the, the attack part, um, and it, with attack, um, they have different categories of uh, command and control, uh, discovery, credential access, privilege escalation, execution, persistence, lateral movement, defense evasion, collection, it, and exfiltration. Of those, these things that are in red are, are detectable you know, on the, the network and um, are something that we can build sensors for. Um, on the pre-attack side, you know, if, you, if you remember the, the, the recon and, and stuff like that, are soft, and, and those are things that happen on the attacker's end that we, we just don't have visibility into. So this is an example of uh, the, an attack, the attack matrix. Um, it, it's actually a, a lot longer and a lot bigger, but this is boiled down to uh, things that you know, can happen on Linux. And 
So, you know, if we take a look at the, the middle column that says uh, host enumeration, uh, this, this is something that, you know, a lot of people would do, uh, you know, which is the recon phase. Uh, you know, once they get in a system, they want to know what's in the system. So they, they know what to attack and what, what they have. You know, maybe they can find credentials. Uh, they get maps of other systems, you know, so they can start to discover, you know, the layout of the network. So, you know, they, they go through a bunch of things like, you know, uh, identify the distribution, uh, identify the kernel, uh, enumerate the accounts, uh, you know, enumerate the file system, you know, find out all the things that, that's out there, uh, group permissions, uh, network connections, you know, what are you connected to? Uh, just, you know, they want to milk the, the system for everything and then go back and study that for a little while and then come back with command control uh, kind of things. But, but the, the matrix has stuff, you know, in each of the columns, uh, you know, if, if you want to persist, if you want to escalate privileges, uh, if you want to evade defenses, you know, there, there's a catalog that shows all the different ways that, that you know, people, people can do this. Okay, so, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the action on the objective, which is, you know, the thing, once you're in the system, what are the kinds of things that people want to do? Well, as a normal user, uh, you want to retrieve and collect information. Uh, well, that, that's like the last step you want to do. Uh, you want to access files and resources. You want to look and see what kind of keys, you know, is in the account. Uh, you may want to install programs to, to sniff, uh, you know, keystrokes. Uh, you may want to alter the account in some ways that the, the user has the, the right to, to alter, like, for example, the bash RC file. Um, and you may want to <coughs> gain entry to other systems, you know, which is the lateral movement. But the main thing that you want to do is you want to escalate the root, because from there you can you know, start and start thought and modify services. You can add accounts. You can enable accounts that are already on the system. Uh, you can watch other users. You can disable and weaken system uh, security, you know, so that you can do the evasion part, um, erase evidence, and, and sniff traffic. So what we'll do is we'll, you know, because this is a big topic, we'll just go into one, one of these and, and talk about that. So, you know, in, in the files, uh, there, there's three things people are after, which is, you know, IP, data, and technical information. Um, you know, things that are, that are intellectual property could be uh, business processes, techniques, workflows, um, information, um, you know, like, for example, uh, well, information like uh, how to do things. Data. Um, you know, it can be sales uh, information, uh, inventory information, customer, credit cards, social security numbers, documents, emails, employee information. I mean, WikiLeaks makes a living off of this part. Um, then there's, you know, the technical information, like the, the, the network layout, uh, host information, uh, things like that. Okay, so if, if we were going to do this, you know, what we want to do is um, use, use something in the system to build a... Um, an intrusion detection system on. And the audit system is uniquely positioned because um, it, it's on the host and anything that it sees is a real event. Where if you do a network intrusion and you're, you're looking at the network, you can see packets coming across and you can see that, that this packet is an exploit for CVE 2018-100. But the thing that it's going to may not be vulnerable, so you, there's always this doubt that you know, what you see leads to an exploit. And just as a way of um, orienting people, uh, since you know the, the, this is predicated upon it, I just wanted to, to show the, the layout of the audit system. Okay, so we, we have the kernel you know, up there at the top, and it's the thing that does all the heavy lifting. Uh, there's a program called Audit Control uh, there in the middle, and its job is to load rules into the kernel. So whenever the kernel uh, creates uh, events, it sends it to the audit daemon. Uh, which writes it to logs, and then it sends it to a dispatcher. Uh, the dispatcher uh, then has plugins, uh, SE Alert, remote logging, and custom applications that can analyze the events in real time. There's also some utilities that you can use to uh, look at the logs. And the kernel, you know, it kind of works like this. Um, an application uh, makes a syscall, it goes into the entry, it does whatever, whatever the syscall is supposed to be, uh, then, then, you know, there's a task filter, it comes back and exits, and, and those red lines are points where the audit system can pick up an event and see that, that something's uh, happening uh, in the system. Uh, just a, a quick thing, you know, uh, the audit rules are, are going to iterate through uh, the events, you know, whenever there's a system call, it's going to see if there's a daemon, if there are, and then it's going to see if there are rules, then for each rule, it's going to just iterate through those and create an event. 
And so this is what the this is called rules uh, look like. Um, you know, there's a there's an add, there's a filter, there's an action, then then the syscall and and the value. Um, but you know, this is not um, uh, something I'm going to go into uh, very deeply. And so what that yields is uh, a non of the event. You know, whenever whenever something happens in the system, uh, you see see an event that looks something like this. Um, th this is um, a, a system call, and which is a, a multi-party event. Um, as as the the code gets uh, uh, triggered, you know, for the for the syscall, different parts of the audit system pick up on on different actions and chime in with their own little uh, observation of what the syscall is doing. So in this particular case, um, it, you know, it was it was noticed that uh, it was accessing a file. And uh, so the, the file system part uh, created path records in current working directory. And then the system call part uh, picked up all the credentials and, and things like that. And then it stuck onto it um, a, a proc title, which gives you the command line of the program that created uh, this event. We also have libraries uh, you know, standardized to let you iterate through um, uh, audit events. And uh, this, is, this is the old style. But you know, as, as you saw in, in the other event or in the other slide, uh, the audit, dog, audit logs are ugly. So the question you know is, what if we can make these things a lot easier to understand? So, in order to do that, you know, we, we take a look back at what what the requirements were, and common criteria calls out for that you have to have a time and date, you have to have who did it, you have to have what did they do, what was being acted upon, and what was the results? Was it success or fail? So what we could do is probably map this into an English sentence that says on node at this time, this acting as something successfully uh, did this action uh, to something uh, using something else. And it looks like this. And so what, what we created last year was something called the audit log normalizer. And it creates um, English sentences out of, out of that nasty audit log because what it does is it has a mapping inside that says, you know, okay, so this sentence is uh, scrub acting as root, successfully deleted uh, this file using uh, xauth. So it picks up the first piece here, you know, sgrub acting as root, uh, successfully uh, deleted this file, uh, you know, during executing of the xauth program. So uh, what we can do with this is now we have uh, the logs in a normalized format, uh, which can then be analyzed by uh, OpenOffice or Excel. Uh, we can pull those events into databases. Uh, you can write uh, R scripts, uh, you know, do charts, modeling, and machine language, or, or machine learning. So this normalized API um, gives you um, information about the event without having to iterate through uh, in a loop. Uh, so you can get the session, the subject's identity, uh, the object's identity, uh, you know, key information, uh, SE links, labels, uh, time, but it also gives you metadata. So you know what kind of event that it is, what kind of subject. Like, is this a privileged account? Is this a service account? Is this a user account? Uh, it also gives information about the kind of action being performed and what the kind of object is. Like, you know, it could be a sub, it could be a socket, it could be a file, it could be other things, but what this does is it lets you subset and create uh, analytics uh, based on the types of things that's being accessed. Okay, so um, the audit uh, system has um, uh, different feeds that we are going to utilize uh, to create something with. Uh, the kernel can detect uh, promiscuous sockets being opened, it can detect core dumps. Uh, uh, people accessing symlinks that, um, are, or creating symlinks that um, have bad permissions, uh, like your your common user and you're linking to something that is set UID root, um, things like that. Uh, we, we can also get events from uh, IP tables, net filter. We can get uh, TTY events. Uh, we, we have trusted programs like PAM, uh, login, SSH, GDM, um, anything that runs through password or shadow utils are all create events. We also have information from policy engines, uh, such as SE Linux and uh, SecCom. But we also can see uh, the system integrity uh, through things like aid, you know, because when, when aid runs, uh, it creates uh, an event at the end to give uh, the audit system a, a summary of, of what it found. 
but there's also another program, uh, the file access policy daemon, which is uh, created to do application whitelisting. And this is an important part of the, the defense that um, I'm, I'm gonna show you a little, a little bit later. Uh, there's also recently created something called the USB guard, uh, which um, if, if you have a USB stick and you put it in and it's an unknown stick, it can prevent that from being used. And it also sends audit events to let, to let the system know that you know, somebody just tried to put something, something in the system that we don't know anything about. Okay, so um, let's take a look at the defense tactics. Uh, we, we really want to detect you know, what's going on. Uh, we want to deny access to people and we want to disrupt their whole uh, system uh, or, or their, their action on the objective. So the kinds of things that we can do you know, against, um, against an adversary um, is you know, we can do alert, we can um, change object permissions, uh, we, can, we can manipulate the processes, we can manipulate the session, we can uh, modify accounts, we can um, do actions against the login, and we can do, do stuff against the interface uh, hardware and, and we can do things against the, the system. So, you know, typical alert reactions might be do nothing, email the admin, or monitor uh, the system a lot more closely. If we're reacting to a process, uh, you know, we may want to trace the process execution and take a deeper look, you know, what, what the thing's doing. We may also want to freeze the process, you know, so we can, um, you know, just stop it where it's at and then let somebody take a look at it. Um, we can also terminate the process check for package uh, upgrades, we can change application permissions, and we can change directory permissions. Uh, session reactions, we can in increase the monitoring of a session, we can freeze all processes, we can block file access, or we can kill the whole session. Account reactions, uh, we can drop supplemental groups, we can move it to a more restrictive SE Linux role, we can force a password reset, we can, we can lock the account. And logins, uh, we can block the login for an amount of time, we can, we can block it for a whole account, we can uh, do it against a specific terminal for logins, we can also block uh, logins for um, addresses, domains, subnets, or geocode. So now, we're gonna get ready for the, uh, the cyber reasoning system and the, the machine learning uh, pieces. So, one of the models that we could use uh, you know, to, to do this is that we have uh, information about the, the origin of a, of a login, an account that they're using for the login, uh, the session information, and we can also see you know, processes and objects that, that's being accessed. Accounts uh, can have multiple sessions, so that um, you, know, one, one, you can have more than one, one session running at a time from one account. But you can also have more than one um, origin. You know, uh, somebody may be SSHing in from, from home, uh, and then they you run a, a different uh, session through a jump box, you know, to the same system. So demons are gonna be um, modeled just a little bit differently. Uh, they, they don't have a session because they don't, they don't actually log in. So the session there is gonna be uh, minus one. And so with, within their session, there's gonna be processes and, and objects. So you, know, you would have Apache and it's, and it's accessing files and, and sockets and things like that. Okay, so here's, here's how I, I think this thing would work. Is that um, when somebody, uh, okay, so as the program's running, we got audit rules that notices things that are happening you know, at the process level. And so if you have a, uh, a process you know, that's starting to go rotten, you know, that it's starting to trip, trip things, what we're wanting to do is to uh, stay in the reputation you know, of, of, of the session and say that you know, there's things that's going on in the session that are bad. But we also want to get a little bit on, on the origin and the account to say you know, that um, this session, uh, running from this account, you know, um, is, is kind of hurting the reputation of uh, where this came from, and also the, the account holder. Okay, so um, the simple, what, what we could do is, you know, to start with this is to create a simple threshold system. 
And you know, I really believe this is the way that it worked uh, for the Cyber Grand Challenge, is that they didn't use um, you know, fancy neural networks and, and things like that. That they had systems that, when it, when it found things, it triggered things, and if, it was, if there was a good enough chance, you know, it met some sort of threshold, that it would be passed on as this is a, a useful exploit. And, th and the reason I'm thinking this is because, you know, as a security system, if, if it probes the system and sees that there's a GPU, you know, sitting on the system, I don't think the security system should help itself to a precious resource. Because odds are that, that GPU is there for a different reason, you know, instead of uh, security. And so, you know, any of the machine learning, I think, uh, going on at this, at this point in cyber reasoning, on a node, would, would not use deep learning, that it would use other things like Bayesian networks, uh, classification, inference engines, um, and, and other techniques like that that's not as, as compute intensive. Now, if you're looking at the whole data center, then you probably do have a GPU you know, for exactly that reason. And you are getting a feed from you know, the, whole, the whole data center, probably with uh, fusion of um, you know, network intrusion detection, so that you can see information about what kind of attacks are occurring on the network, seeing what kinds of things are on the other end, and then reasoning about whether or not the attack may be successful, and then confirming that with information uh, coming from the host. You know that, that may see that you know suddenly there's a shell that, that came out of uh, Apache. Machine learning can probably be used to identify patterns and give uh, you know more context you know to uh, what what's happening, um, so that, you know we don't stain uh, the reputations uh, prematurely. So you know, in this model, you know, with, with just simple thresholds, uh, what we would do is get audit events looking at you know processes and objects, and based on what we see, uh, you know, send scores you know to the session level and to the account and to the the origin, which then once the score gets high enough, then triggers a reaction. Getting a little more fancy. You know, I think that what, what would be the next step in the evolution of this would be an ensemble model, where you have the events coming in, and then it gets split across uh, different systems that look for different things. And then, when, and then those things get summed up, um, and then a, a reaction occurs based on that. So you, you may have something that looks for bad events, you know, things that are, are known bad, like, for example, core dumps. Uh, you may have something that's doing pattern analysis, you know, so that it, it looks to see that, you know, there's a bunch of files being copied, and so we see individual accesses, but, you know, there's a pattern to all this that uh, somebody's doing ransomware, you know, and that they're, they're scooping up every file on the, on the system. Uh, there's also um, a, a need to do burst analysis because a lot of times attacks happen in bursts, you know, where there's a lot of activity, then it stops, and then, you know, nothing happens for a while. And so you need a piece that's looking for, for things like that. But you also need something about historical norms so that you learn what the behavior of the system is, that you know, somebody comes in at, you know, between 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock every morning, they leave between 5 and 6 o'clock every day, and that you know, whenever there's an access at 9 o'clock at night, then that's, that's an anomaly, and it's outside the historical norm, and that, that may you know, lead to some kind of reaction. And then there's also misuse uh, detection, which is um, when you know that there's a, a specific attacks. And, and so this would be, uh, you know, identifying that somebody is running an exploit, you know, tr trying to escalate privileges. Okay, so now wrapping back around to the stuff from the, from the beginning. Uh, the, the attack model, um, and, and there's another one, uh, which is uh, CARS, which is uh, the corresponding uh, I, I think it's the cyber analytic uh, repository of sensors. And so what this is, is it's a, um, a repository of what you need to do to detect different things that are in the attack model. And MITRE has this working for the Microsoft side of the house uh, using their uh, uh, system logging system, uh, and system event system. But you know, they've recently reached out uh, to me to talk about bringing this to Linux. And you know how they would use the audit daemon uh, to uh, create you know their cars repository. Um, so going beyond this, um, I, I think that you know the model needs to work into to it the notion of a um, 
of the system. Uh, you know, perhaps that's a, a summation of all the things that's happening on the accounts, or perhaps you know, even the, the demons itself uh, feed to uh, system reaction. So what I'm going to do, you know, originally I planned uh, to uh, let you guys attack my system and let you guys uh, find out, you know, how a cyber, uh, you know, an autonomous security agent might, might behave. But in doing some testing out in the hall, it seems like the wireless network here doesn't allow system-to-system uh, -system communication. They're, they're blocking that. So instead, you know, what I'll do is I'll just demonstrate briefly how it, how it works uh, so you can see what an autonomous security agent uh, does. And so what I wanted to show you is a little uh, system diagram of um, what we got. Um, you know, there's, there's the demons. Uh, you know, they access the file system. We have rules uh, in the kernel that can see everything that's being accessed. Uh, there's also an application whitelisting daemon that if, the, if somebody tries to run a program uh, that, that's not known to the system, then it's going to block the program. And then we have the audit daemon, which is, which is getting all this information. OK. So uh, what I'm going to show you is that there's, there's four sets of rules uh, that's in here. And these, these all map back uh, to the, the attack matrix. Um, when somebody's doing reconnaissance, uh, you know, like for example, you know, they, they just get into the system, they just got the shell, uh, they're going to try and enumerate the system. You know, they may run the W command to see who all is on the system. Uh, list of open files, uh, who may run SS, you know, to look at uh, the network uh, route. They might run mount uh, to get to get more information. Um, there's another set of connect, uh, another set of uh, rules that's watching for connections. So, like for example, if you know the exploit runs, and now they're ready to download uh, their their tools, you know, so they can uh, act upon the objective. Uh, it's going to watch things like wget, elinks, curl, ftp, git, uh, scp. And once they got the tools, you know, the next thing they may try to do is unpack them. You know, so there's rules watching for unzip, uh, tar, gunzip. And uh, sometimes during installation, they try to, to, you know, make an executable. So the other major component to this is the application whitelisting daemon. So, um, I'm going to stop here for a second and uh, and show the show the system. And right now, what it's doing is it's uh, re rebuilding the database for the uh, for the application whitelisting daemon. Okay. All right. So there we got the the audit system is is up and running, and um, yeah, I created a, an account for this uh, hack me, and um, you know password is is hard. I was going to let you guys hack this system, and so now if you take a look, the um, the system now sees that uh, there's a session uh, number four. And you know it's got the the origin information. It's got the the account uh, that that's active. You know, hack me. So now, if we decide to do some of the things like um, you know re reconnaissance, you know, because normally there's going to be a script that people have. Uh, suppose they decide to look at uh, LSOF and see what all's what all's uh, what's going on. If you look now, you see that there's something that says the session now has a score of two. So if, if they persist and decide you know, they want to see the, uh, the mount table, now you see that the session you know, has, has bumped up again, and now we're, we're on four. So um, suppose they, I'll just run LSOF again just to, just to have something to run. So now we're at six. So let's, let's pretend that uh, you know, they've already got uh, you know, some reconnaissance and they're ready for some attack tools. So we're going to run uh, wget, but you know, I'm just going to run, run this. And that's, that's pretty much, pretty much uh, it. Let's. OK. So what I wanted to show you here was that this thing just hit a session score of 12, and the system reacted. 
uh, by running kill all, you know, to kick the, you know, to kill the session. So um, let's take a look over here, and you see that, that we got logged out. So let's let's go back into the system again, you know, because we're a hacker and we just got kicked out and we don't know what's going on, and uh, you know, we want to see we want to see uh, what all is on the system. So let's suppose the wget worked and they just downloaded some some tool. Um, you know, this is um, myls, which is uh, something that's completely unknown to the application whitelisting daemon. So let's let's run this and see what happens. Okay. Now let's take a look. We got kicked right out because the thing is, you know, if there's if somebody's running a tool that's unknown to the application whitelisting daemon, then that's even worse than somebody doing reconnaissance because that could be an exploit that they're getting ready to run. So the application whitelisting daemon saw it, said, no way, you're out of here. And the score was high enough that it also uh, created an IP tables rule so that now you can't get back in. So as an analogy, you know, for the way the, the autonomous security system works, it's kind of like, you know, you're at a bar and you're talking to a nice girl and all of a sudden you wake up and you're in the street, you got blow your nose and you wonder what happened. And that's what happens. You trip across something, you're out. And if you trip across enough, you can't get back in. So. Okay, so um, this is just a little bit forward-looking stuff. Um, remember the, the original diagram? Um, one of the things that we're gonna be doing in the audit system is getting rid of that dispatcher, and that will shorten up the latency, you know, so the reaction times are a little bit faster and a little more uh, reliable. There was uh, some challenges in, in putting together a cyber reasoning system. Um, the events have to be uh, well-structured. Uh, it, the audit system's kind of like a gentleman's handshake in that you could write anything you want, you know, but if you do, then it's probably not going to be analyzable. And so the, the events really need to be structured and, and clean. Um, I also found that GDM and LightDM are, are not uh, ending sessions correctly. Uh, SSHD uh, works fine, which is good, you know, for doing servers. And I also found that uh, SLinux policy needs a way to allow transitioning out of um, the audit dis dispatch uh, domain into something that's more powerful. Uh, so that it has the ability to reach out and kill a session or to create an IP tables uh, rule or to do any of the other reactions that we, we talked about earlier. Uh, and one last thing is, you know, lo looking at the ensemble model technique, you know, working out the pattern recognition and, and some of these other things would, would be the next steps to, to look at. So, I want to leave you with a thought here, that you know, if we do get these autonomous security agents working good, then that's gonna uh, be one step toward taming the beasts, or at least putting them on ice. This, this really happened in North Carolina just a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Alligators were frozen in the pond; they had to breathe, and that's it. Uh, I, I would say that that's a possibility. You know, of course, the one I designed right here doesn't do that. But you know, I, I would say, swarm swarm mentality would would be something. You know, where they report back to a central place, and then it spreads information. You know, to to the other things. Because I I can easily see having something in the data center that's analyzing what's going on across the the data center, and saying that. This machine over here is being attacked from this IP address. You guys watch out for, for that IP address, too. And if you see it, escalate much more quickly than this one did. Yes? Can I see a sample uh, agent that you were just showing? Was it already using some machine learning techniques, or was it um, programmed to watch out for certain events and then increase the session score and so forth? Okay, so the, the question was, uh, was this using uh, machine learning to, to understand the events or did it have some sort of inherent knowledge about what the event meant? And in this particular case, uh, we used a broad grouping. There was a classifier that said, this is a syscall kind of event, 
so it's going to go and be processed with these syscall event types. This, this event is a, a X, uh, application whitelisting daemon event. It's going to go off and be processed by, by the thing that understands the application whitelisting daemon. There, so there, there was you know, some classification in there in terms of what type of event, but nothing more fancy than that. It was mostly thresh, threshold kind of things, which, you know, going back to this uh, Cyber Grand Challenge, seemed to work very nicely for those people. Yes? Uh, excuse me, can, uh, can you repeat that? I didn't hear it. What do you do if you just got thrown out of your own server for the first time? Okay, so the question is, what do you do if you just got thrown out of, a ser of your own server for the first time? And, you know, with, with a system like this, uh, I, I would make whitelists, you know, so that you can have a way to get back into the system and recover the system. Because you don't want it to be completely, completely autonomous. You want to have a, a backdoor way to get in, like for... For example, maybe um, you have to go log in through the console, and so any login through the console is immune, you know, but you would, you would definitely want to make a way back in. Other questions? Yes? So, so I guess the, the question here is, uh, does, has, has this created a new weakness? And, a uh, yeah, a new potential weakness. And, and that would be based on... <coughs> firm. Okay, so, so the question is, uh, you know, if, if people attacking the system through, through network, um, Traffic, you know, can can they cause the system to shut shut down certain things? Well, if, if I've, I've got a server around the internet and that thing is being pounded, absolutely pounded, uh, and it's, it's specific addresses. You know, you can look and you can see that most attacks are coming from about seven or eight different addresses, and they will hammer your system until they decide that you, they can't get in and they move on to some other system. But by then, somebody else has come along. So, in in my experience, you have about a hundred different about 100 different IP addresses, you know, that are accessing your system, but probably about five to 10 that are just hammering hard on your system. And so something like this, um, because of all the bad logins, you know, it could figure out, you know, that you can do an IP tables um, command, drop that address, and those, those guys are gone and no longer have, have access to your system. Um, you know, again, you can create loopholes, you know, whitelists, things like that, so that if there's something that you're supposed to give access to and they get compromised and they attack your system, but you, you're still supposed to give access to them, you know, you, you should still be able to create, you know, white lists and so that it doesn't do the wrong thing. Could, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so I guess the comments that this could be just another interface for, for attacking. Yes, you know, any computer software code is, you know, can be abused um, in, in some way. So yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. But you know, I, I would think that uh, we, we try to limit the, the damage by you know, judicious placing of whitelists, you know, things like that. Yes. Well, well, that too, you know, because this doesn't replace all the hardening stuff that, that's done, you know, in the first place. Yeah, it raises the bar because, you know, one of the things that people do is they steal credentials. And so now they have valid access to a system, you know, and it may not be root, but they got valid access to a system. And, uh, and then again, you know, this was just a contrived example, you know, um, to, to show, you know, how the, these kinds of things could work. So 
so uh, the question is, what if, the, what if somebody gets access to a system and, and then does nothing? You know, does that make the, the system relearn uh, this, this new rule? And I, I would say yes. You, you know, in, until you make a move, until you actually you know, make an advance towards the target, you know, it's, it's not going to react. It's just going to let you sit. But when you make a move, it's watching. Um, so, if I understand right, the question was, um, will, will agents be able to exchange information and, and learn from each other? Um, yeah, I, I, like, like I said, I, I would envision a you know, fully-fledged system to have something watching the data center so that when something is identified in, in a, a host, that it creates an audit event you know, that describes what it's, what it's just seen on the host and a response event saying, this is what I did, and this is my confidence factor of, of what it did. And then the, the thing analyzing the data center could see that, and you know, it can watch and, and spread information you know, as it sees fit. Like if it sees um, that this, something, somebody came in from this IP address and they immediately tried to, to escalate to, to root, then if it sees any other login from that IP address, it could let the other ones know, you know here's a seed value for this origin you know, so that the score you know, goes through the roof fast. Any other questions? If not, uh, I thank you, and uh, I'll, I'll be around if you have other questions. Thank you very much. And please leave your feedback on uh, schedule. Thank you. Sounds good.